Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we talk about investing, hard money, Bitcoin, and how technology is revolutionizing the global economy. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. So this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Make sure you're subscribed to my page so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. First up, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company that is focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin. Swan can help you start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan's mission is to educate 10 million future Bitcoiners through free resources and media projects like The Hard Money Show. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA, tax loss harvesting, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average, and I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. Swan Studios produces my hard money news reports, simplifying Bitcoin for mass audiences and documenting Bitcoin adoption around the world. To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. All right, next up, Bitcoin Conference 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin event is headed to Nashville next year. Early bird tickets are now available and this is the lowest cost you'll be able to secure for the conference all year. And if you use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, you'll get an extra 10% off. So come join us for three great days of networking events, panels, keynotes, workshops, and more. You never know what big name might be announced when tickets are much, much higher in price. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL. And before Bitcoin 2024, the next conference I'm headed to is BitBlock Boom this August in Austin, Texas, where I'm really looking forward to speaking alongside Preston Pish, Mark Moss, and other great voices in the space. You can get your tickets at bitblockboom.com and use code HODL for 10 percent off. I'll see you there. All right, it's time for the show. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk today with Matt O'Dell. He is the host of the Citadel Dispatch podcast and Rabbit Hole Recap. He's a writer, investor, the godfather of the saying, stay humble and stack sats. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Nat. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you this week because a lot's been happening in the space, but I want to start by focusing on the privacy and security issues. There have been some prominent Bitcoin names that had SIM swap attempts, uh, Pete Rizzo, Preston Pish being among them. So let's start at the very beginning. Can you kind of break down and explain simply what is a SIM swap? So a SIM swap is when someone convinces uh, your cell phone carrier uh, to swap possession of your phone number to them. Can you explain how someone would do something like that? I mean, the fact that prominent Bitcoiners are getting these attempts, it surprises some people, right? Because we're so passionate about OPSEC. So when, um, let's say you're just an average person, you're a normal person uh, and you lose your phone. You lose your phone and you want to go to the AT&T store or the T-Mobile store and you want to get a new phone and you go in and you tell them your phone number and they activate that new phone with your phone number. Um, it used to be a lot easier to do that. Now, when you go and do that, a lot of times they'll ask you for all these different questions. Maybe they'll ask you for your driver's license. They'll ask you uh, maybe security questions or something like that that you have attached to your account. And the reason is, is because a malicious person could do the same exact thing. And then as a result, they receive any calls or text messages that would normally go to your number. Um, So different carriers have different policies in terms of what you have to do in order to um, initiate that kind of change, basically activate a phone number on a a new device. Um, But a lot of them are insufficient. Scammers have figured out how to get around those uh, requirements. And then also a lot of times what we see is we see people that are internal to these organizations you know, if you're working at T-Mobile and you're getting paid ten dollars an hour, um, and someone says, you know, here's a list of Bitcoiners, and they have, you know, maybe high value accounts attached to their phone number, that person might do it for five hundred dollars. That person might do it for thousand dollars. That person will definitely do it for twenty five thousand dollars, right? So, um, we basically ended up in this situation where our phone number is is being used almost for American audience, almost as like a, a social security number. It's used as an identifier 
Um, it's used as access control to get into a lot of accounts, including bank accounts, email accounts, uh, Bitcoin exchange accounts. And as a result, they've become very high value targets, uh, but but the carriers haven't really caught up yet. I mean, and I, to a degree, you shouldn't really expect a T-Mobile employee to act almost like bank level security or something like that. Like they they have to essentially operate in this much higher OPSEC environment for the actual company itself. If you're T-Mobile, you have T-Mobile employees, you need access controls on who can access uh, this different information, who can transfer over the access to the accounts. Um, and they're just not there yet. It's a, it's a give and take basically. So what happens when someone gets SIM swapped? If, if their attempt is successful and they're able to essentially take control of your phone number, what can they actually do and, and get off that SIM card? So, I mean, this depends on the individual, right? And you're not actually getting any information directly from just getting SIM access, right? So you get SIM access and, and then all of a sudden any text message or phone call that's supposed to go to that phone number goes to the attacker, right? Now, a lot of accounts have systems in place where if you wanna do account recovery, it uses your phone number as the authentication method. Um, this is very popular on email accounts, right? You Let's say you have a Gmail account. And one of the ways you can, can see how vulnerable you are to SIM swaps is if you're using Gmail or you're using another email client, go in there, click forgot password, right? Pretend you forgot your password, click forgot password, try and go through the account recovery process. Very often that account recovery process will say, we are gonna send a text message to your phone number. If that's the case, if they send a text message to your phone number and you put in whatever code they sent you and then you get access to the account, so can attacker. So can an attacker who has access to your phone number. Um, so a lot of times what happens is, first of all, that email, your, I, I, know, I know we have a lot of uh, non-technical people that listen to your show, but really you shouldn't be using the same email address across everything. But I'm going to be very practical here. 99% of people have one email address to rule them all. It's attached to every single account. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your first thing that needs to be hardened. Because what happens is even if your Twitter account or your bank account or something like that can't be reset with just your phone number, a lot of times it can be reset with your email or your email plus phone. So what an attacker will do first is they'll go and they'll try and access your email account. Once they access your email account, then they go onto Twitter and they say, forgot password. And then yeah. Twitter says, we just emailed a code to your email account that the attacker has access to. And then the attacker is able to get access to that. You see the same with exchanges. You see the same with banks. Um, so the first step is go into your email account, press the forgot password button and see if you can recover with just your phone number. If you can recover with just your phone number, so can an attacker. And you need to go into settings and, and start toggling settings um, to basically stop that from happening. Why are we seeing an uptick in this? And why do you think that so many people that are in the space are vulnerable? You know, I think uh, in general, we just haven't lived in a world where so much of our lives is digital. This is the first time. Like people don't realize, everyone's like, oh, you know, this is the way it's always been. It's not the way it's always been. Um, we have increasingly uh, significant portions of our lives that are digital whether that's social media, which are can be very high value accounts to, to compromise social media accounts, whether that's online banking. And of course, with Bitcoin, with Bitcoin specifically and the greater crypto uh, industry, these transactions are final. They're digital money, right? Mm -hmm. that, that once a transaction is sent, you can't cancel that transaction from being sent. So that's particularly attractive uh, to attackers. But I think it's just, it's it's a microcosm of the fact that we're just increasingly digital. And malicious people are always ahead of the curve. Malicious people always start to use the tools before everyone else. They figure out different ways to do it because they have a straight monetary incentive to figure it out. Um, and and basically, the average person is is playing catch up to try and protect themselves from these types of attacks. So in the worst case scenario, how could someone that does a SIM swap access your Bitcoin? So, I mean, first of all, uh, there's a there's a common saying, not your keys, not your coin. Um, and that signifies that if you don't hold self-custody of Bitcoin, uh, you're holding an IOU. Um, and it's become 
I, I understand that it's 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 a hurdle for people when they're just getting started to learn how to hold Bitcoin securely, uh, but it's easier than it's ever been. Um, and I do strongly, I, I strongly believe we need to make the tools easier, much better. We need education to increase and improve. And this is where a lot of focus of my time has been. But as it stands today, um, people figure out how to drive cars. People figure out how to raise kids. You know, people can figure out how to hold Bitcoin themselves. It's not as difficult as you think it is. And you need to, you need to basically sit down. You know, you have a long weekend or something, sit down for an hour or two, get your feet wet, try and learn how to hold Bitcoin yourself, practice with it, receive, hold it, uh, send it, back it up, restore it, um, go through these processes. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up because if you hold your keys yourself, if you hold the Bitcoin securely yourself offline, never touches the internet, which is possible. So some of your audience, they might not even realize it's possible. You can actually hold this digital money offline without it ever touching the internet using something called a hardware wallet, um, then a SIM swap cannot get you. So when we see SIM swaps take uh, take control of Bitcoin, steal people's Bitcoin, what happens is the person is, has Bitcoin on an exchange. They have Bitcoin on a custodial exchange, essentially IOUs. And that that person, the malicious actor, will will compromise their account. Let's say they take, they take over their Coinbase account. They take over their Coinbase account. Um, and then whatever Bitcoin's in there, they'll withdraw it to themselves rather than withdrawing it to you, because why would they help you out and withdraw it to you? They withdraw the Bitcoin to themselves and they take your money. Now, if you have no Bitcoin on a custodial exchange, it's still important uh, to protect that account because a lot of people have their bank account attached to it. So we've actually seen attackers go in, compromise an account. That account has no Bitcoin in it. And then they buy Bitcoin. They go and stack sats with your bank account, and then they withdraw it to their to their self custody. So they'll they'll actually drain your bank account through uh, the exchange. So in either situation, if you have any Bitcoin exchanges um, that that you use um, that allow you to easily buy Bitcoin or you're holding Bitcoin on them, which you shouldn't be doing, uh, you need to make sure they're secure. And I, I I would basically tell you to go through the same exact steps that I said to go through with your email. Go in there, click the forget password button and and see how you can restore it without your password. And if you can restore it with just your phone number, then the same thing can be happened with the SIM swap. And you can if you can restore it with your email or your email and your phone number and they access your email, then you can be SIM swap. Then you can have your Bitcoin stolen via SIM swap as well. Those are such great and important points. Thank you. Um, do you like those password managers where there's essentially an encrypted password and then you have the very, very difficult ones for everything? Because I I, I know one issue that I think is just a, just a broad challenge for most people is every every website you essentially need a new passport, password for, but it gets a little bit confusing and how do you store them? So what do you recommend? Do you recommend one password? Um. So, I mean, this is a little bit tricky and it depends on every individual. Um, first of all, yes, you don't want to reuse passwords across uh, services because if services do leak passwords, they leak passwords mm -hmm. often. All the time. Um, and yeah, so if you have one, pa if you have a password get compromised on one site, um, it can be used to access your other sites as well. Um, so you don't want to reuse passwords and you do want to use secure passwords. Now, there is a... Um, think about it logically, right? You have high value accounts. You have accounts that are really high value and those should be using very secure passwords. Um, but then you do have accounts that really, no one really cares. If, if someone accesses it, it's not the end of the world, right? So you don't have, I, I would say people often get overwhelmed and they don't use secure passwords for the sites that are really important um, because they feel like they have to do it across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, you, like I said, your email address, that one email that you use for every service, that needs to be the most secure password. Yeah. No matter what. Um, and then from there, you know, your bank account, all these different high, maybe social media, if it's really important to you, like you should have a very secure password. Anyway, so now they have these password managers, right? That yeah. make it so you have one password to remember, and then it stores all your other passwords for your sites. That's what I meant when I said one password, the company yeah. is ma manager, not actually having one password. Um, well, my problem here is you do have a little bit of all your eggs in one basket. So if that password that gets compromised is your password manager's password, mm -hmm. then they have all of your passwords. Yep. A malicious actor has all of your passwords. Also, 
uh, we have seen situations like LastPass, uh, which is a similar service, where LastPass had a vulnerability. And then as a result, anyone who used that service was also vulnerable. Oh, wow. Um, so, and but there's issues here, right? Because what's cool about 1Password and what's cool about LastPass um, is that it's it's stored in the cloud. It's stored on someone else's computer. It's stored in on their server. So all your devices access it. It's really easy to use. Um, but as a result, you do have this single point of failure. And we saw that happen with LastPass. Um, there's different threat models. I it's not a it's not a bad idea, uh, but it's not foolproof. I really like uh, very old fashioned, just a pen and paper and a notebook. You just have a pen and paper and notebook. You keep your most secure passwords there. Um, someone has to literally come offline and grab your notebook. Uh, you have the the negative trade off there of you have to manually type it in. It doesn't have this clean app that just automatically pastes it into the site for you. Mm -hmm. But you have this really nice analog security, which is it's on a pen and paper. It's not on a computer. It's not on an internet connected device. These are my most secure passwords. Uh, it's going to be very hard for someone to compromise them. And then you could still use like a one password or a last pass or Bitwarden. Bitwarden is another one of these services. What's nice about Bitwarden is you can actually self-host it. Uh, so you can host it on your own server instead of someone else's server. You can use that for your other passwords, but like maybe like your, your three to eight, you know, most secure websites, you put that in the notebook. Uh, and, and then, then, you know, it's offline, you know, it's super simple. Uh, and it's way harder to compromise it. You know, it's so fascinating it, within the Bitcoin space as I've been learning more about OPSEC and privacy. I saw this graphic about um, essentially attempts on hacking a password and the brute force and how it doesn't take very many attempts in order to guess an easy password. And the more letters and capitals and numbers and um, you know punctuation marks that you use, the safer you are. And I, I didn't realize how easy it is to actually, I, I guess there are even machines that can do it. They can do it digitally and just try all these different uh, combinations or words um, and they can essentially get into your, your accounts. Yes, correct. Um, I mean, to people that are familiar with Bitcoin, you could think about it almost as mining, but for passwords. Yeah. So they use these computers, they use GPUs usually, um, and they're basically just trying every combination. Uh, sometimes they won't even have to try every combination. They'll use, if some of your passwords have leaked or if they have personal yeah. information about you, like the name of your daughter or something, right. uh, they'll include that in the attack so it'll speed it up. Um, what does help here is, so people are probably... Uh, most of your audience is probably familiar with this idea of two-factor authentication. Yes. Yeah, I was um, going to ask you about that. So two-factor authentication is you go to sign into your bank account and you put in your username, you put in your password, and then they go, we just texted you a code and then add that code. Now, we've been talking about SIM swaps. Using the text-based two-factor uh, is not ideal because if someone SIM swaps you, they can also get that two-factor code. But they have apps on your phone that essentially generate codes offline. So when you set up your account, you choose a uh, two-factor app instead of two-factor SMS or whatever those specific site it calls it. Most important sites now do offer this. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's hidden. Sometimes they, they push you into SMS two-factor first, text message-based two-factor first, and then you have to go into settings and change it. But you wanna change it to this app-based two-factor. Then they give you a QR code. You scan the QR code with the phone app, and then every time you sign in, even if you don't have internet reception, because it's it's offline on your phone, um, it'll show you a code. Uh, and then you enter that code to sign in. That makes you much, much more secure uh, than if you're not using that. So even if your password is insecure and someone gets access to your password, they still need that two-factor code. Now, okay. my two favorite apps for that is if you're on Android, there's an app called Aegis, A-E-G-I-S, which is fully open source, very easy to back up. It's a fantastic app. And then if you're on iPhone, there's an app called Authenticator Plus. Um, also, you can back it up. I don't believe it's open source, but also you can inspect source on iPhones anyway. Um, but it's it's heavily, it's it's highly rated. The interface is really easy to use. And and just doing that step alone, adding these two-factor apps to your flow for your important for your important services will will offer you significant protection over over most people. So if you have that authenticator app, even if you're SIM swapped, they cannot access your accounts like Twitter and Gmail. Is that correct? If your account, 
in settings, you make sure that mm -hmm. there's no recovery via SMS, right? That's why that's why the the number one thing to do is go in and try and do the forgot password flow. Because sometimes you might have two factor, you know, a lot of these sites, you know, they're just not built for security. They were yeah. they were never designed for security. They kind of added band-aids on top. And also there's a belief, there's a, a large belief in tech, and we see this overflow into the Bitcoin industry as well, where people, where designers and developers choose convenience over security. Right. So they, it's almost paternalistic. They're like, oh, a user can't deal with this extra friction. They're not going to sign up for my service. So a lot of times, even if you have two factor, the two factor app set up for, for actual two factor authentication, if you go through the forget password flow, it can just get accessed via a phone number. So you have to make sure, and the easiest way to do that is not going into settings, not is clicking forget password and pretending you're an attacker that has access to your phone number and is trying to, to access your account. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference tickets with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. You can also buy Bitcoin and stack sats directly on Fold and earn even more incentives and rewards. This is a great app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin and way better than earning airline miles or hotel points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie. And if you use my link, you'll get 100,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. I'm so excited to share that I have partnered with CoinKite and we are committed to making sure everyone has the information they need to safely self-custody their Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I am switching to for safekeeping my Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin only. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure. And as I'm learning, it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. If you head to their site in my show notes, you can find all of their products from cold cards in different colors to seed plates, top signers, sats cards, block clocks, which I have behind me, and more. I'm also in the process of creating some how-to videos on cold card. So watch out for those in the near future. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. All right, back to the show. And just to clarify, because a lot of people, when they saw that Preston got SIM swapped, they were like, oh my gosh, if he has my phone number in there, now my phone number's compromised. Uh, or some people were wondering if pictures all of a sudden are now on someone else's device, but a SIM card doesn't have that information, right? Correct. But I would say one of your most secure accounts, if you're an Apple user, is your Apple account. And you want to make sure that your Apple account get, can't get swim swapped, uh, oh. can't get reaccessed with a phone number. Because if 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 an attacker can get into your iCloud, uh, then they have your contacts, then yeah. they have your message backup history, then they have your photo backup history. And the same thing goes for Android users with Google accounts. Um, you ha you want to treat those as 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 that top echelon of 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 security in terms of of how you treat that account. You want a very secure password on it. You want to make sure that it can't um get sms swapped i think apple by default now um because I, I think it might have been a similar attack if, if you remember a bunch of celebrities it was like 10 years ago or something yeah. a bunch of celebrities got their photos taken on icloud yeah i think it might have been related to some kind of sim swapping apple now defaults to um i believe because i don't i don't use apple devices but I basically administer all my family's Apple devices. They default to sending a notification to some other device that you already have attached to your account and like pops up on the top. It's like, did you sign in with this new iPad? And then you press okay. yes or whatever. Um, so I think they have some precautions, but once again, the easiest way is, you know, try, load up a load up an iPhone or go to apple.com and try and sign into your iCloud account with just your phone number. Just out of curiosity, yeah. why don't you and use Apple? Number. Um, I don't like, I don't like the lack of freedom that Apple, uh, as you know, Apple, every, every tool has trade-offs, okay. um, and Apple devices trade-off is, uh, almost paternalistic. They, they give the average user, frankly, more security, um, and more privacy, uh, and more convenience, but at, at the, at the cost of freedom. So like we're seeing right now. I don't know how familiar your your audience is with the Nostr ecosystem, uh, a bit. but uh, you can think of the the layman's way of thinking about Nostr is a censorship resistant 
a version of Twitter is the first app that's being built on Noster. And they had Bitcoin payments built into it. And Apple decided you can't you can't do that on the App Store. So right, as a result, is, right? yeah. So as a result, you can't even the average iPhone user can't install that app. Well, they took out the offending part that it, that allowed Bitcoin transactions. But I'm being long-winded. My point is, is on Apple, um, Apple decides which apps you can install. Yeah. On Android phones, uh, you can choose any app and you can install it even if it's not in the App Store. You can install it outside of it. You can customize. You can do all these different things. You can even run an Android phone without any Google parts, all the Google parts removed. Um, oh, so wow. you have a lot of custom customization and freedom when you use uh, Android devices and Apple locks it all down uh, in the name of convenience, security, and privacy. Wow. I I knew that Apple is a gatekeeper, but I didn't know that the alternatives allowed for more of the apps on there. But I was actually going to ask you about that because it seems like there is sort of a deplatforming and apps that have the lightning functionality and want to facilitate those lightning speed payments are getting censored essentially and not being able to have that wide audience for people to download. Are you concerned that's going to keep happening? Uh, yes, I, I, I expect it to continue to happen. Um, a lot of people weren't around, but in 2014, 2015, Apple didn't allow any Bitcoin wallets in the app store, yeah. period. Um, and they backtracked because it was unpopular and they want their users to be happy to a degree. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if it's something like Noster that involves free speech that can't be censored, uh, it's going to be more likely that uh, the app stores aren't going to allow it. Uh, if it's Bitcoin wallets, uh, which is payments that are very hard to censor, um, it's going to be more likely that they're not allowed on the app store. And we already see this kind of happening. We've seen this happening uh often uh, in terms of uh, in foreign countries. So Apple wants to operate in China. Uh, that means Apple's app store in China limits. They don't they can't install the same kind of apps uh, that that Americans have the privilege of installing because the Chinese government doesn't want you to have certain apps and right. Apple listens to them. Um, now, I think this is in terms of types of attacks we could see against Bitcoin. Uh, or Noster, this is very low bar. It's you know, it's a curated app store uh, for a specific tech company, even if it is the biggest tech company in the world. Um, and I think uh, first of all, we do have other options. Uh, you you can use an Android phone. You can even use an Android phone that doesn't have Google, and you can install any app you want to install. Um, obviously, Apple hasn't locked it down on computers. Yet, on if you get a normal Mac out of the store, you can install any app you want. You don't have to use their app store. Obviously, that's the same for Linux and Windows. Um, so we still have options. And I think long term, I think long term, what happens is, uh, you know, if if big if we're right about Bitcoin and Bitcoin becomes the money of the world, and if if we're right, I mean, frankly, if I'm I'm very optimistic about Noster. If I if Noster becomes the communication protocol of the world. Apple's going to have no choice. They're going to have to eventually uh, allow more openness with their store. And also there's a tiny other piece of nuance here, which is there's this um, Epic Games, which is this uh, video game company that makes Fortnite. They're most popular for Fortnite. Okay. Um, has been fighting Apple over their app store restrictions because Apple has this requirement that uh, for most companies, 99% of companies, their standard requirement is if you do an in-app purchase, uh, Apple gets 30% of that cut. Mm -hmm. um, and Epic Games doesn't like that. So Epic Games has been suing them um, and has actually has pulled their game. Their game is available on every single platform except for iOS and Mac. Oh, um, wow. And they did that because they didn't want to pay. They thought Apple's 30% cut was uh, uncompetitive, uh, which it, it is. Um, so I, I believe they're, they they either won in the EU or they're on the verge of winning in the EU. And so at wow. least European iPhones, you're going to be able to install apps yeah. outside of the App Store. Um, and I just would it, it just seems like such an obvious, it just seems like an obvious win for so many different industries. Um, if if users are given the freedom to install apps outside the app store so or competing app stores right on android you have many competing app stores hmm. um on on apple devices on ios devices you only have a single app store so i could see that happening i could see apple you know backtracking on a lot of their policies um but we'll see but for now they're gatekeepers 
at the end of the day, that's the trade-off balance you make when you buy an iPhone. They choose which apps you can have and which apps you can't. Got it. Yeah. Well, let the market speak. That's what a lot of us believe. Um, you mentioned earlier the importance of taking self-custody, but you also said some of those solutions hopefully will become easier in the future. Uh, what do you say to the people out there who really want to own Bitcoin, but they don't want to take the responsibility of self-custody? They're hoping for a solution in which you could you know, equate it to the situation we have right now with banks. Essentially, you have an account, you, re- you trust them, even though we all know that if everyone were to pull out the money, uh, they'd all be insolvent. But at the same time, no one does. Um, so people feel safe you know, putting hundreds of thousands of dollars in banks, they do more research on what phone or I, I, iPhone product they're going to get as opposed to where they put their money. So how do you see this all playing out in the future? Do you think that most people will take self-custody and should? I, I personally am of the belief uh, that the path to hyper-Bitcoinization is, is billions of people getting rugged over and over again um by trusted third parties by these different institutions that they trust with their information with their money um until they figure out how to they fi- they they realize the need to take personal responsibility over their digital lives and then they act on it and start using the tools um there are middle grounds uh for now there's i mean i i really like the product out of unchained capital where they they essentially hold your hand through the whole process you have a person you can talk to um but and and there there's they set up this multi sig uh, wallet for you that has three keys and you need two keys to spend. Mm-hmm. So they hold one key for you, you hold two keys, and if you lose one of your keys, they can still help you and 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 help you move your Bitcoin for you. So they're they're holding your hand, but they can't take your money. Right. And I think what people don't realize is, yes, it's easy to compare it to the banking system. Uh, in America, especially, everyone trusts their banks. Mm-hmm. Most people trust their banks. Uh, it's easy to compare it to Venmo or PayPal or or Cash App, where everyone's just you know. Th- there's there's average people around the world that their job they 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 take their money in Venmo. They get paid in Venmo. They trust that Venmo is going to hold their money and not steal their money. Um, I I think what happens is even it's not just Bitcoin. Like in Bitcoin, we saw FTX. We saw Celsius, we saw BlockFi, we saw Barry Silbert, we saw Prime Trust. Um, we have saw time after time institutions lose your money. Um, but it's not just Bitcoin. We've seen that happen in 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 the fiat world, too. We've seen that happen with the banking system. Yep. Silvergate Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic. And, and practically what happened right now is uh, the U.S. government bailed out all the existing, all the banks that remain. They bailed them out ahead of time. And the banks are still teetering on failure. Um, so I think people get rugged in the banking system. I think bank runs continue. I think I think people get they they lose their information that they're storing on cloud services, their photos that are important to them. They get leaked, they get stolen. And I think the same thing happens with Bitcoin and people will just learn over time. And I would say just to your audience, it's not as difficult as you think it is. Yes. If you can drive a car, mm-hmm. you can securely hold Bitcoin. If you can okay. raise a kid, you can definitely hold Bitcoin. Every single mother in the world can hold Bitcoin. It's way, way more difficult to raise a child than it is to hold hold Bitcoin yourself. Yeah, they don't send you home from the hospital with a manual. So um, yeah. You don't even get a BTC Sessions video. There's <laughs> nothing. You get well, no I'm, guidance. I'm glad you brought that up because for everyone watching, I am going to be releasing a tutorial on how to use the cold card wallet with BTC Sessions. He's going to help walk me through the whole process so that people can see how easy it is. Anyone can do it. I am i don't have a technical background. Uh, so I, I hope people will check out that episode soon. But pivoting a little bit to the headlines, you mentioned Prime Trust. I really want to get your take on that because reading some of the court documents I and the legacy wallets and the lost access and the questions surrounding what's going to happen with that 80 something million dollar hole, or I think it's actually over a hundred million. What's your reaction to all of it? Yeah. So with prime trust, they said it's an $80 million hole, uh, but their total liabilities are 150 million and like 80 million of it is just some shit coin that no one's ever heard of. It's like uh, audio, audio or something. Which they're they're not going to be able to sell that and actually accrue eighty because it's not a liquid market. So yeah, the hole is probably significantly higher than hundred million. Um, Prime trust is an interesting one because in in Bitcoin we talk about trusted third parties being security holes, um, and that goes for your exchange that's holding your Bitcoin. 
Now, what Prime Trust business was, was they were the back end for a lot of different brokers and exchanges. So they were actually your trusted third party's trusted third party. And then Prime Trust actually then trusted another third party called Fireblocks that actually held the crypto part of it. So whether it was Bitcoin or all the different shit coins they supported, uh, Prime Trust relied on Fireblocks to hold that part. And then Prime Trust essentially had five or six banks that held uh, the dollar balances for people. So when you put it all together, uh, an exchange that was using Prime Trust was also relying on Fireblocks and like six different banks. And so it was trusted third parties all the way down, bunch of different centralized points of failure. Um, and it, it was a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, that disaster happened. Now, it is very early. But to me, it just reeks of fraud. The whole thing just looks like there was fraud. I mean, at the very least, there was a cover up that happened over a year long cover up. I think they found out in December 2021 that they didn't have uh, all the Bitcoin and shitcoins that they thought they had. Um, and they tried to cover it up. Um, and the market was just, you know, the market was super high at that point and it kind of came down and a bunch of services pulled off of them. I think they were they were they were used by many, many different uh, exchanges and brokers in in the industry. So, I mean, we'll see how the fallout uh, unfolds. I think in general, uh, first of all, the, you know, hold your own keys, hold your own Bitcoin. Yeah. And most of this is just noise. Most of this, you know, when, when, when FTX fails, if you're holding your own keys, yes, you know, the price might go down for a little bit, um, but your Bitcoin is safe. Uh, when Prime Trust goes down, same thing. Um, so the tried and true, what people don't realize in Bitcoin is it's a game of survival. It is a game of survival. And that's why when I say stay humble stacks, that's the humble part is important is because people people constantly put themselves at risk when they don't have to put themselves at risk. They You need to be humble enough to realize, first of all, you don't know everything. And then second of all, that, that there's risks around every single corner and you need to reduce your risk on an individual level. This is a movement of personal responsibility. If you don't take care of yourself, no one else will take care of you. But also the prime trust news, I think, is indicative of a bigger phenomenon that we're kind of seeing throughout the financial sector, which is, and we saw this in 2008. In 2008, um, we saw the first bank collapse. Mm -hmm. And then for six months, seven months, all, all the talking heads said, everything is fine. Everything is fine. There's no collateral damage. And right. then we started having bank after bank go down and we went yeah. into a uh, global depression. Right. And I think there's all these different you know, intertwined third party risks all throughout our financial system and the Bitcoin system. Bitcoin is, is, is connected through these bank accounts and through all these different trades that are happening from bank account to Bitcoin. Um, that we just don't see. They're hiding beneath the surface. Um, and there's a lot of people in trouble and they're not going to come out and be like, we're in trouble because then they're going to get bank run. They're going to come out and be like, everything is fine. There is no need to be concerned until, you know, the straw breaks the camel's back. And then you see, you know, you see the actual carnage underneath. It's, it's really sad to see how many people that entered into this industry at large uh, turned out to be frauds and cons. And, uh, you know, the bubble had to pop for us to know exactly what was happening under the surface or for the greater public to understand, because I know a lot of Bitcoiners were were sounding the alarm. But how do you see the, the ecosystem it, evolving going forward because you know to get mass adoption people obviously need a place where they're going to buy bitcoin they don't necessarily want to go you know behind their grocery store or in the alley to exchange peer to peer um they they want to put their fiat onto a rail and exchange it into bitcoin and those exchanges obviously are holding bitcoin um and so in that in that interim process do you i know that you're like kind of you want you want free markets to reign. You don't. I don't think you like big government or big regulation from from everything that I've read from you. So how do you see the ecosystem evolving, especially as regulators try to come in more and more into the space and uh, are filing lawsuits and all of it? You know, I think uh, you know maybe we can have a constructive art, uh, discussion with regulators if they weren't completely corrupted, um, but. Uh, Regulators will not going to help this situation. If anything, regulators will put people in more risk at the end of the day, in my opinion. Uh, you you turn into situations where I, everything, there's way less competition. 
Um, there's way less freedom. There's way more surveillance, which puts tons of users at risk um, in terms of surveillance. I mean, if you want to talk about who you want right. to SIM swap, who should I SIM swap? Uh, that starts with trying to find leaks from these different exchanges on how much Bitcoin people own and who they are and what their phone numbers are, right? And why does a Bitcoin exchange even take your phone number to begin with? Well, that's because of regulators. Um, so, I mean, I do believe that free markets will always win. I also think the cat's out of the bag. I think even if a particular jurisdiction like the U.S. decides to heavily regulate Bitcoin, um, the global markets will continue and there'll, there'll be, you know, plenty of global free markets that you you cannot squash from the U.S., even the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is the number one financial regulator in the world. They go after everybody, um, but it's it, they can't they 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 can't get everybody. Um, so I think it will happen regardless. Um, I think I think, look, at the end of the day, there's always going to be fraud. Um, I think uh, with with freedom oriented tools. Um, it's unavoidable, uh, you know, and we see this, it's, it's greater than Bitcoin. I mean, we see this with, um, encrypted messaging, encrypted messaging, uh, is, is often touted by politicians and regulators as something that criminals use. Mm -hmm. Um, but encrypted messaging also protects everyone who uses an iPhone and uses iMessage by default. They're protected by encrypted messaging because, you shouldn't have other people reading your private conversations. And it makes you vulnerable if they're reading your private conversations. There's real need for that for people, uh, but bad actors will use it. And bad actors will use Bitcoin. Bad actors will constantly sell get rich quick schemes throughout the Bitcoin and crypto space because people don't want to practice personal responsibility. So they're going to go to the get rich quick schemes. There's a reason why uh, there's crypto YouTube accounts that have 10X, 100X, 1000X the amount of audience that you have or I have on my YouTube account. And it's because they get onto YouTube and they say, you have to do absolutely nothing. You just send money to my partner here and you will get a thousand X. And there's always going to be people that, that take that deal. And, yeah. and what's going to happen is they're going to get burned. Their friends are going to get burned. Their family's going to get, it's, it's sad. It's sad, but it's true. They're going to get burned. And then they're going to realize the need to improve their situation. And they're going to seek out, you know, better practices, actually practice personal responsibility, actually do research, actually educate themselves um, after they get burned. It's just the unfortunate reality of the situation. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, I want to share with you about CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs are sky high today, and you send your money every month to a massive corporation, and then you never see that money again, even if you don't need a doctor. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. CrowdHealth is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you and you need medical care, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you help cover others' needs, which has been so rewarding. I am so glad I switched to this program. And for more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie and use promo code Natalie for a discount. I am so excited to share that I have joined Orange Pill app as an advisor. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you are missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping to create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You can create a profile and you will see lots of familiar faces there. And then you can search for Bitcoiners or Bitcoin events based on your location. I am geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm super grateful because the Orange Pill app has helped connect me with Bitcoiners in my new city. So come join us, download the Orange Pill app and head to theorangepillapp.com for more information. All right, back to the show. Is there any way that you see for sort of the system at large to... Um, ensure that custodians are honest and transparent and actually not doing the kinds of things that Prime Trust was doing? I mean, the fact that they rehypothecated, they used customer funds to try to purchase back. I mean, they turned into a Ponzi scheme. Is there anything that could have prevented that? I mean, I just... A, there's been a lot of bad regulation, not just in Bitcoin, that mm -hmm. comes from a good place. Mm -hmm. that goes through the corrupted system and then hurts the average person that I've lost complete faith in that protecting people. And as a result, um, we, we fortunately have a tool like Bitcoin that we can hold securely ourselves. 
Yeah. And we can obviate all of that. If you hold Bitcoin yourself and you withdraw it to your own hardware wallet, like Nat said, she's going to have this cold card tutorial. You withdraw it to your cold card. It doesn't matter what frauds are doing. It doesn't matter if there's any right. kind of lack of transparency. It doesn't matter if if there's the improper reporting or improper audits because you know you have your Bitcoin and and it's very hard for someone to take that from you. And I would just go back to the banking system um, where we've seen, you know, the the banking system is heralded as this, the US banking system is heralded as this like super safe, super secure uh, institution, like global mm -hmm. institution, all these different banks. Oh, you could, of course you can trust JP Morgan. Of course you can trust, you know, TD Bank or Wells Fargo or whatever. But what they do is they just stomp all over us. Like that is their their strategy is just a like oh we pr we're protecting you so you can only withdraw four hundred dollars from an ATM today. We're right. protecting you so you can't make that two thousand dollar debit card purchase or you can't send a ten thousand dollar bank transfer to someone without coming in, giving us your ID, telling us what you're spending your money on. Um, so they essentially like the solutions, the so called solutions are always just stamping on individual freedom mm -hmm. um, in the name of this greater centralized control. And if the centralized controllers are corrupt, then you just have, you know, you just have more issues than than you even started with. Such valid points. I wanted to ask you before we pivot to a little bit of your back and origin story about what you've been writing on Twitter regarding the blue checks. Um, one of your tweets said that Essentially, um, you think it's similar to the China social credit system coming to the West, Elon basically requiring that you pay in order to have a blue check and verify that you're a human. Can you expand a little bit on your thoughts and what do you want the average person to know? Because one thing that I've noticed is no matter who ran Twitter, uh, the bots are just increasing in um in how ferocious they are. They're trying to scam people. I have to report accounts uh, daily. And you mentioned, you know, the YouTube accounts that are basically asking for people's money. I'm sure as AI proliferates technology, there's going to be more and more um, very real looking videos or, or posts and, and people are going to be tempted to, to believe that they're actually real. So what do you want people to know about uh, your thoughts on that? You have, um, I, I believe you have a blue check, correct, Nat? I do. Yeah. But I uh -huh. actually had one before because I was verified through my old news network. So, um, so I did pay to maintain it, but yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person. I still, you know, I still converse with blue checks. Um, <laughs> so my issue is not the payment of the blue check. Uh, I think the payment of the blue check is a clever way of that Elon is basically hiding the mass verification of users. My issue is the identity verification of users and particularly the centralized control of it. So, I mean, my conviction in Bitcoin, my conviction in Bit and freedom tech comes down to this idea that anything that has centralized control by humans will be corrupted. And I think we've seen that across our institutions. Um, I think people witnessed that um, under previous Twitter leadership. I think people have witnessed that in PayPal when they just block your accounts out of nowhere. They just take your money. They just take your livelihood. Um, and I think it's no different with new Twitter management under Elon and under um, Miss Yaccarino from uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, who's the new CEO. And I think I think the key here is is people think, OK, I'm paying for a blue check. Um because I don't want to be a product. There's that there's a famous saying, if you're not paying for a service, you if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. Um, right. But the blue check is a little bit different because you might be paying them, um, but you're an even better product than someone that doesn't verify their identity. Essentially, what's going on is um, data is very valuable. Data on people is very valuable. We see advertisements are 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 basically surveillance capitalism this idea of of being able to sell people's data to to advertisers and other corporations uh and and be as effective as possible for it facebook google twitter they all compete over being able to convert your ad spend uh as easily as possible and the, and the way they do that is essentially by surveilling their users as much as possible the more data they can get the better um so I think uh, where we're going with this, and right now, 
you know, with a blue check uh, to get a blue check, uh, you pay with credit card. So your credit card is most people's credit cards are attached to their identity. Right. Um, and you verify your phone number and most people just use one phone number. And one thing we missed on the SIM swap is it's good to have multiple phone numbers, by the way. Yes. Like Google voice um, and all that. Yeah. 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 There's an app on, and, and you don't have to like, you know, if, if you have really good OPSEC, you should be going and paying with cash and buying prepaid numbers. But there's apps that you can pay with Apple Pay, like Burner app and Hushed app. Uh, well, they'll you just pay with Apple Pay and they'll give you like an infinite number of phone numbers and you can oh, use wow. them for different services or whatever. Now, obviously, like the NSA, the CIA, like if they're in your threat model, they're going to be able to connect that to you. But for the average person, that gives you a lot more protection. But anyway, to get a blue check, you do a phone number, uh, you do a credit card. Um, people can get around that. I've talked to many people. They're like, oh, like, you know, I didn't have to dox my identity. I didn't have to give up my identifiable information to get this blue check. But that's, first of all, 99% of people aren't doing that. And then second of all, what's going to happen is this first layer isn't going to stop the bots. So they're going to require more and more information. And we've seen Elon specifically say that he wants to make it the WeChat of the West. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I say, <laughs> yeah, he wants to call it X. He wants to include payments. He wants it to be integral to your everyday life. Um, and so when I say this is Elon's attempt at the Chinese social credit score, um, I am not speculating. I am literally taking him for his word, literally what he has said out loud, uh, which is he wants to turn it into WeChat. And WeChat is the key vessel of the Chinese social credit score. So if you're in China and you get deplatformed from WeChat and you're not able to use WeChat anymore, you can't rent, a, you can't rent an apartment. You can't travel on the train. You can't buy groceries. You're completely depersoned in that situation. Now, do I think he can be fully successful on that? Probably not. You know, maybe he maybe he will be, but um, it's a very slippery slope. It's a dangerous slippery slope. And the answer to a bot problem or the answer to um, spam concerns um, is not having a centralized actor taking increasingly more and more personal identifiable information. Like we will see, I am pretty confident that we will see more and more information be required to maintain that blue check. Um, and we will essentially see a situation where Twitter becomes unusable if you don't verify your identity. Right now it's mostly soft incentives, edit a tweet, post a longer video. You get boosted in replies, which is pretty dark in, you know, in terms of like, you have to verify your identity if you want more engagement or your, you want your tweets to be seen more. And we're already seeing that you because he made the view counts public. You can see a blue check sends out a tweet. They might get way less engagement on that tweet, way less retweets, way less likes. They'll have a way higher view count than right. someone who has not right. verified their identity. And I think it's just, I think it's a really dark, slippery slope. And it's a lot of power to give to a, to a private company. Um, and I think people, I think people are going to regret it. And we already kind of, we're starting to see the, early signs of it um, with the different uh, everyone always talked about like mainstream clickbait news cycles. We're mm -hmm. starting to see that in Twitter. They have the Twitter has its own like news cycles where there's things that they get people really riled up about the Twitter spaces all get filled. You see yeah. blue checks all over your feed. Yeah. And Elon wants that. He wants you addicted to this app. He wants you addicted to this app. He wants you fully dependent on this app and he wants you to, to essentially be proud of giving him your personal information in order to have the privilege of of using it. And that's dark. And I think most people just, it's, it's, it's really disappointing. It's really disappointing how many people kind of just refuse to admit it. And I think people will admit it over time. Um, and for whatever reason, I stumbled into having a very large audience on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And most people with large audiences on Twitter have just succumbed to the blue check and have submitted and complied and submitted their personal identifiable information. Um, so I felt like I should be the one to stand up to it. And I like, I like other people to stand up with me. It would be nice. Yeah, no. And, and I certainly felt that pressure as well because, you know, with the blue check, I felt like even though I'm still getting impersonated and some people are falling for it, 
less people are because they do know if it's the blue check, it it definitely is me. And, you know, going back to what you said earlier about the idea of good intentions, but then the outcome is bad in so many, you know, aspects of our, our lives. I, I thought at first, well, you know, I wish it was a different process or maybe a different type of check mark or something so that you can still designate what, you know, what's an organization versus someone with a, a following or a credential versus just the average person who, who is verified as a human. I thought that the intention was good in the sense that it would remove the bots and it hasn't. And so do you ascribe to the belief that I think Sailor was one of the biggest people to say that there should be like an orange check that's attached to your lightning account. And then there's essentially an account an escrow account. And if you were to spam, then you would rack up a ton of money that you owe. And so it, it would basically render uh, bots and spammers useless and and um, and unable to, to pay for their spamming. Right. So, I mean, Sailor's uh, proposal is essentially um, if you put in a cost to if you put a financial cost to account creation um, and if you uh, or potentially even put a financial cost to actually posting. Yeah. Um, you'll have way less spam and you'll have way less malicious actors because they actually have something to lose. Right. Um, I, I think there's something there. I think also, you know, what's happening on Noster is 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 really beautiful. So Noster uses a public key, private key pair, uh, which is similar to how Bitcoin works. Um, so your private key is what you keep secret. The public key is what the rest of the world knows. And every message you send. Um, is essentially signed with your private key. So anyone can cryptographically verify. Really, right. in action, what happens is their app is verifying that yeah. your private key signed this message. This was sent from, mm -hmm. from Matt because, because yep. this is the key we know. Um, and then Nostra also has this ability to basically link it to a, a website that you have control over, mm. um, which is not perfect because the way yeah. website control works uh, is is also centralized, but it's a little bit more distributed um, than just like this one centralized database. I think I think both approaches make a lot of sense. But here's the key: the key is the blue check is not it's it's not he, that's not the goal. The goal is to get as much identifiable information on users as possible. Got it. Uh, there's a reason why like, Elon is well aware of how Bitcoin works. He he had his whole engineering team set up. Tesla so that they could accept Bitcoin purchases for cars without a third party. He he modified BTC pay server and set it up so he could take complete self-custody to Bitcoin, like the most technical, great way of doing it, most freedom oriented way of accepting Bitcoin. Most large companies will rely on, you know, a third party processor like an Ibex or a Strike or an open node. And Elon actually did it, you know, the freedom oriented way. Yeah. So he knows how Bitcoin works. Uh, the reason he wants credit cards is, first of all, he wants easy subscription, but he also wants that he's using it as an identity check. He's using the credit cards as an identity check. And here's the thing. If 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 the blue check was about selling you a product, you wouldn't have ads. The reason you have ads, even after you pay him, is because the paying part is just a smokescreen over the verification part. The verification part is the important part because you're actually a better ad target than a non-check person, than a person that hasn't verified their identity because they know exactly who you are. They know you're not a bot. They know they know your your likes. They know where you live. Um, and they're able to sell that data and make significantly more money off of you. The actual idea that the $8 per month is the revenue generation stream for Twitter is a complete smokescreen. It's the the real the real revenue generator is having millions of people verified. Like you said, particularly in a world where AI starts to become more prevalent, where bots become more prevalent, having the largest database of verified humans is incredibly valuable and is incredibly dystopian, in my opinion. You know, it's really crazy. And I wonder where this is all going to go. I've warned in the past, especially when he was taking over with Twitter, don't have heroes. Some people um, like to put him on a pedestal or other powerful people. I just urge people to be very careful. Even in Bitcoin, don't have heroes. Don't trust Verify. Um, if you could spare a couple more minutes, I'd love to try, just get a little bit of your backstory, your origin story. Um, do you mind? Do you mind staying a little longer? No, my pleasure. I'm enjoying this. Okay, well, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you got into Bitcoin and just start from the very beginning. Where where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Um, so I'm not going to go that far into it. Okay. Um, but my Bitcoin story is is actually probably a lot of people could be, you know, feel familiar with it, which is this idea that 
um, it takes multiple touch points before you appreciate Bitcoin. Yeah. And um, my first friend told me about Bitcoin and he was using it to buy drugs on the Silk Road um, and use those drugs. Uh, and he had, unfortunately, a significant drug problem. So I completely disregarded him. Um, and then my second friend was actually a straight edge, a straight edge kid that was a developer. And then he told me to check out Bitcoin about like eight months later. And I was like, how the hell can these two different people, completely different people, both recommend the same thing? And, and you have to realize that, you know, I was, I was like, very, as a, as a young kid, I was shook up by 2008, the financial collapse to me, the 2008 financial collapse was was uh the emperor has no clothes moment there's no experts in the room everyone pretends that they know what they're doing uh but there are no adults no everyone's just winging it everyone has no idea what they're doing um so 2008 was a big wake-up call for me in that regard and then as i was getting introduced to bitcoin so that first touch point was 2012 the second touch point was late 2012 early 2013 and at this and at the same time the snowden leaks came out um, and what Snowden showed us, what Snowden showed us was you can't trust the tech companies. 2008 showed you you couldn't trust the financial companies. And then 2013 with Snowden showed you you can't, you can't trust the tech companies. And I was completely disillusioned. I was disenfranchised. I felt like there was no hope. Um, I, I still see that today, even more extreme with a lot of my peer group, with a lot of people our age. Um and and freedom tech gave me hope open source software gave me hope software that is not controlled by an individual a company a government um and as a subset of that bitcoin gave me hope and i basically went down the rabbit hole as um well first i kind of aped in a little bit uh and i had like no money obviously i was a young kid um and then i was down 95% um 2013 Price shot up to twelve hundred dollars, went all the way back to one fifty over the next three years. And there's either two things that happen when you're down ninety five percent on your life savings: you either uh, end up developing more conviction, or you cut and run. And what happened was I just went down the rabbit hole, and I just kept trying to figure out how Bitcoin couldn't work. I tried to uh, basically steel man the argument for Bitcoin, and specifically from the context of. Um, which a lot of people when they first see Bitcoin is the US government will never allow this. Um, and I, I tried to operate under that perspective and slowly and steadily, I was like, I don't, I don't think this thing can be stopped. Um, I don't think, you know, the, the 21 million cap can be changed. I don't think Bitcoin can be changed very easily at all. Like that's the key value prop. The key value prop is that Bitcoin is incredibly difficult to change. Um, and as a result, um, as adoption increases, the price should increase. And second of all, as censorship increases, the need for the ability to, to send value through the internet without permission becomes more and more valuable to people and people will realize it over time. And um, yeah, and I just, I, I basically dedicated my life to education and, and to this movement. Um, I, I like, I came, I came to the conclusion that, you know, this is a tech project. It's easy to think it's code, but ultimately it's a movement of individuals. Um, and if we're going to win, we, we're going to win off the backs of individuals that actually push this movement forward. And I basically developed, mostly organically over time, I developed this this like four, four prongs of what I spend my time on, which is uh, public facing education through the podcast, through Citadel Dispatch, through Rabbit Hole Recap. Um, also a lot of hands-on work. I've been doing a lot of hands-on work with human rights foundation and activists around the world for almost four years, five years now. Um, and then, uh, I helped launch 1031, which is the largest Bitcoin only venture fund. So we support, uh, Bitcoin companies that are pushing this movement forward. I co-founded OpenSats, which is a 501c3 nonprofit where we support open source developers, no strings attached. We take zero cut. It's a hundred percent pass through. Um, and then about a year ago, I, I launched um, with my co-founder, Rod, here in Nashville, I launched Bitcoin Park, uh, which mm -hmm. is, is meant to be an in-person campus where we can focus on community development and education and, and those important discussions that you just can't have on air. So it's all about 
it's all about pushing this movement forward and it's all about supporting the individuals that help make that happen. Well, you're doing such a great job. I'm I'm really grateful we had the chance to to talk. And and one thing that I've always respected about you is I get the impression that you are a very moral and ethical person um, who believes that respect is is earned. It's not given. You have very high standards. Um, you're not afraid to call out people, even if they're they're your friends. And so I I really respect that. And I was kind of curious where that comes from with you. I don't know. I don't know, Nap. There's definitely a lot of mutual respect, by the way, um, here oh, uh, from you. from me to you. Um, I I just, at least in the Bitcoin space, I guess a lot of it just was growing up in the Bitcoin space uh, because I've been in this space for a decade now. Uh, it feels like a long, it feels way longer than a decade. And just there's been so many scammers. There's been so many scammers. There've been so many fraudsters. The stakes are really high. It's people's life savings. Yeah. Um, and iron sharpens iron. It's like uh, people don't realize. Once again, I will just say it's a game of survival. People don't realize um, that it's a long term game of survival because there's a confirmation bias when you see people on Twitter or in person or whatever that have been in the Bitcoin space for eight years, nine years, ten years. You're like, oh, like. This is easy. But what you don't see is you don't see the thousands of people, the millions of people that got washed out and lost all their money in between. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it I guess it molded me. But also, you know, um, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a, a very um, loving and supportive family that has has ingrained certain values into me and and life is short. So um at the end of the day, the priority should be our friends and family. And and when it comes down to that, then integrity is really all that matters. You you said it right there. I'm sure they're so, so proud of you. And we're really grateful to have you in the space to educate everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Is there anything else that you want to share that you think people should know, or maybe something that I didn't ask you that you really wanted to share with the audience? Um, I have over 200 hours of educational content on the Citadel Dispatch YouTube feed uh, or podcast feed. If you just search Citadel Dispatch, you'll find it. Yes. Um, I'll link it in the show notes. That'd be great. And um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for having me. And I want to say to you and I want to say to the rest of your audience, uh, I think we have 40 plus free events in Nashville for the for the next year. Uh, come to Nashville. Come visit us. Come shake our hands in person. We have a fantastic airport. It's very centrally located driving wise. If you want to take a car instead and just come to Nashville and, and see what we're building here at the park, I think you'll enjoy yourself. Uh, well, count me in. I'm definitely going to be one of them. So I look forward to that. Matt, thank you so much. And everyone watching, I'm going to have all of his great educational content, his podcast work, his companies, Bitcoin TV, all of it linked uh, in the show notes. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for watching the video version of the show. I really want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or guest recommendations, you can email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Please subscribe if you want more content and I'll see you next time.